I, yeah, I came authentic. I, heard, I, I do too. I came right from the job suit. Like My cocktail address is at the cleaners. <laughs> I, you know, lovely presentation. Thank you so much uh, for that, you know, insane lead. And like, what do you do to top that? <laughs> but, you know, I want to take the time to talk about my mom, um, my guiding inspiration for my 41 years on this earth. Mom was Catholic. Mom uh, was Catholic. <laughs> she might be lapsed at this point. She might be really doubting it at this point. No, I think she's hanging it. But mom and my dad met at Wharton at University of Pennsylvania. And I think they met instantly on the quad and shared a love of science fiction novels and uh, comic books, Pogo. If anybody remembers Pogo. And, uh, the way two molecules just find each other and bind immediately, even though they might produce an acid. <laughs> they did, and the lifelong bond was assured. And I think my father, who is a, my mother's my height. My father is yay big. My father had a love, of, still has a love, Harley Davidson motorcycles wow. and Colt 45 firearms and uh, <laughs> pursued a PhD while roller skating around the quad of the University of Pennsylvania and teaching, while my mom pursued her master's in theology while teaching at Country Day School of the Sacred Heart at Seagull Line in Haverford, and which eventually moved on to Bryn Mawr, another store. And they lived in somehow. Books connected them. The science fiction books of the month club would come in, along with my father's Easy Rider magazine, which I found endlessly fascinating. And my mom never bothered to look at that, but she was really interested in the science fiction novels that they share. And they lived these wildly disparate lives while managing to raise a family of four kids. And that was what my dad signed on for. And then myself and my little sister came four years after before. So, there's a tight knot of like the four older brothers and sisters, and then there's me and my little sister, and we fought like two cats in a sack the whole time. I mean, she eventually beat my ass like, you know, years later, and we called a truce. But until then, we fought like cats in a sack. Now, the four older brothers and sisters were in a clique of their own. They had their own thing going on, and they, they had no use for the two younger brothers and sisters that had entered the midst. That was a ramshackle five-bedroom house in Overbrook with 24 cats, oh a leaky roof. Oh uh, you know, it was at one time steam heating um, that got converted to gas by my father, electrical engineer. And you know, me being a fifth child of six, I had a passionate craving for attention that manifested itself at its earliest when I carved SP was not here in the back of my nanny's Buick. Uh, I don't know how I got caught. I wasn't, I wasn't caught in the act. I've never been caught in the act of anything. But anyway, the evidence was overwhelming and it was a week of pure torture. But, you know, the Buick, I, I think, is in the Smithsonian right now. I'm not really sure. I can hope. Um, my father shot his firearms. My mom read her books. Life went on for about 14 or 15 years until my father, who was working at Penn, was teaching at Penn, was working at Penn, pursuing his PhD, like all that was happening, but he's also working on computers, which was a novelty at the time. And, you know, he had built his own lap, his own desktop computer with a mouse. I remember seeing it in like 1979, green screen with the, the light green diodes on it, being endlessly fascinated by this. But he was already distant from us. He was already away from us. His bags were already packed. He was already at the door. And, you know, he was working for the government. At some point, they granted him a higher clearance, and they took him into a side room, and they ran testing on him, and they found that, wow, you're borderline paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> Here's the money. Go to the door. Don't touch computers anymore. And my father, he started, he moved down to Farragut Street in West Philadelphia. We were living in 64th and Drexel at the time. And then eventually just, but I was 15 at the time. And all I wanted was my parents to leave me alone. Let me figure out what 
I was and what I was to become or who I was going to be. And the disappearance of my father was a very convenient, <laughs> miraculous event in my life that allowed me to pursue who, whatever I was going to become. And I knew, even as an infant, I didn't want to be my dad. <laughs> that was clear. And I think my four older brothers and sisters, who were very intently reared by my father, they've suffered their own psychological problems and defects from this, and they've had to negotiate their own settlements. But me and my little sister that really had no contact with the men, we're all good. <laughs> so, but mom, always steadfast, mom, always there, mom, always teaching, mom, always the wise old owl in the family that would just try to tell me, do the right thing, do the right thing, be responsible, do the right thing. You know, at some point, you know, from the time I could fast forward from the time I was 15 and I was let loose to figure out my own destiny and what that meant. The last words I remember my father saying to me, he gave me his stack of golden age comic books, those Pogos, those detective comics, the Supermans, the Blackhawks, the, the, the Walt Disney comics and stories featuring Donald Duck drawn by Carl Barks worth thousands of dollars. He gave them to me and he said, whatever you do, you better have a plan. There's always going to be somebody better than you. There's always going to be somebody that knows more than you, can draw better than you. Whatever you think you are as an artist, you're not. Forget about it. You're just another guy. There's always somebody in the pipeline that's better than you. He was wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I figured that out, you know, I sold the comics to pay for tuition at the University of the Arts. <laughs> and that worked out great. Um, wow. University of the Arts at the time, how much is tuition at University of the Arts right now? $34,000. <laughs> it was twenty. It was like 20, 25 at the time. And the only reason I had the whole smorgasbord, I was a natural illustrator, I could draw Superman real good. And I had a love and affinity for painting. But the only thing I took at University of the Arts was graphic design because that looked impossible to me and I figured well you know if you're in art school you should learn something you don't know in the hopes that you know you get something out of it and graphic designers you know they have the ties they have the clean shirts that look like a good way to go <laughs> obviously I didn't graduate or else <laughs> but you know I liquidated my father's comic books you know every time a tuition bill came due I mean, I was going to probably sell them anyway, but the fact that I put it in my education looked like a really good idea. Yeah. And that was a good you know, legacy my father gave to me. But the rest of it was just crazy. I mean, he came home with hand, like these handmade Israeli street sweepers that were $2,000. And we had a family of six. We had cat shit all over the place, ruined furniture. No you know, I was borrowing clothes off my neighbors. It was like ridiculous. And we were in Overbrook. It's a nice neighborhood, you know? I had neighbors like dropping off bags of clothes to us because they felt bad for us. But um, you know, once you can endure wearing Johnny O'Brien's, you know, leather jacket because you love pushing it, and you can push your dad's car out of the driveway, and then your mom smacked you for why weren't you helping your father? Why was Johnny O'Brien helping your father? It was me. I was wearing Johnny O'Brien's. Don't give me that. <laughs> you know, this set you up for you know anything you needed to do. So. You know, my mom, when she retired later, you know, 10, 15 years after this mo momentous moment when my father left home, I had changed her worldview as to what you could do as an artist and as an individual to the point where she would walk in front of her class and just say, don't listen to me. <laughs> my son never did. He, he turned out fine. <laughs> and out of all the artistic triumphs I could, you know, highlight tonight in that wonderful introduction, like, that trumps them all. Yeah.